Welcome, early birds. Uh, we're gonna get started in just a couple of minutes. So we are uh, we are just uh, waiting for the clock to tick, and uh, we will get started very soon. And we're very excited to be here today. All right, hello everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in to our very first Developer Summit on Recommendation Systems. My name is Ashley Oldacre and I am a Program Manager from Google. And we are very, very excited to be here with you today to talk about the latest trends and techniques in one of the most important ML applications, Recommendation Systems. So at the summit, you'll have the opportunity to learn from some of the leading experts in this exciting yet challenging field. And whether you're just getting started or you are a seasoned practitioner, uh, you're sure to find something valuable at this event. Um, just a few logistics. Uh, there is a Q&A area below your screen. So if you scroll down uh, below, you'll see that there's an area where you can type your questions. And we will try to address them uh, in the Q&A time. Uh, which will be at the end of each presentation or via um, the uh, or in the page below. So feel free to just ask uh, ask questions and we will we will respond one way or another. Um, this video is being recorded and we will upload the TensorFlow YouTube and we will upload it to the TensorFlow YouTube channel for on-demand viewing afterwards as well. Um, and feel free to share your feedback on TensorFlow Twitter uh, or on the TensorFlow forum as well. Um, a quick uh, a quick overview, recommendation systems, often called recommenders, uh, are everywhere and super useful in our daily lives. Um, from recommending movies or restaurants to highlighting entertaining videos, recommenders help you surface compelling content from a large pool of candidates to your users. So for example, YouTube and Google Play, both of which have billions of users, extensively use recommendation systems to serve interesting videos and apps to the users. Other than Google, many, many other companies also heavily leverage recommendation engines to increase user engagement and generate, and generate business value. Um, generally speaking, recommenders leverage data on past user behaviors to make future recommendations. From a technical standpoint, ML-based recommendation models determine how similar videos and apps are to other things like and then serve up a recommendation. So, for example, if you are browsing on YouTube and you've just watched a couple of TensorFlow videos, chances are you're going to watch another one instead of what's new in Chrome video. Uh, we know this from other users' behavior. If a lot of people watched a bunch of TensorFlow videos together and you happen to watch one, we can then use their behavior to teach the model to pick the next TensorFlow video for you as well. Um, so that is the basic idea behind recommendation engines. Uh, you watch something and it recommends based on your preference the the next video or the next thing that you might be interested in. Um, of course, in practice, there is a lot of technical work happening behind the scenes to make this happen, which is why we have organized this summit today. Um, you can you can view the agenda. Um, we've got uh, building production recommendation systems is not as simple as training a single ML model. Um, and there are usually multiple ML components that need to seamlessly work together. So today we have chosen seven talks touching upon various aspects of modern recommendation systems. Our speakers are from various Google Teams, uh, and we have a special guest speaker as well. Um, and many have personally authored or open source libraries in the latest cutting edge research papers. 
So first we will hear from Wei to give a more technical overview on recommendation systems. Um, and I would now like to pass it over to Wei. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wei, and I'm a developer advocate uh, from Google. Um, I'll be giving a, a quick overview of modern recommendation systems today. Uh, so next slide, Ashley, please. So there are many different approaches to build recommendation systems, one of which is called content-based filtering. Uh, so this approach uses item features or item similarities to recommend uh, items to users. Uh, so here we're illustrating uh, four different apps, and um, some of them are education related, some are you know, health, healthcare related, and some are just time wasters. Um, so if a user installs an app that's related to education, then we can probably recommend more education related apps to that user because that user has a strong interest in education related content. So that's the basic idea behind content-based filtering. But we'll come back to uh, this uh, in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. Another approach is called collaborative filtering. So one limitation with content-based filtering is that it only uses item similarities or item features. What if we can use both uh, user similarities and item similarities at the same time? That would enable serendipitous recommendations. Uh, for example, recommending an item to user A based on the interest of a similar user B. So here we are illustrating four users in five different movies. Uh, the first user has watched Harry Potter, Shrek, and The Dark Knight Rises. And the third user, she has watched Harry Potter and Shrek as well. So in this case, it may make sense to, uh, to recommend The Dark Knight Rises to the third user as well, because she has similar interest to the first user. So that's the basic idea behind uh, collaborative filtering. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we do this? How do we solve this problem? Um, so let's say we can assign a value uh, between negative one and positive one to indicate each user's uh, preference or interest in children's movie. Uh, negative one mean, be, me, means the uh, highest level of interest in children's movie and uh, positive one means zero interest. Similarly, we can assign a value between negative one to positive one to each movie as well to indicate whether that movie is suitable uh, for children's uh, for children. So now, if we take the product uh, of uh, this value associated with user and the value associated with movies, then we get a value. If that value is uh, is is as high is high, then we expect the use the, uh, the more likely that user may enjoy the movie. So now, basically, these values have become the embeddings for the users and the movies, and then we have a hand engineered uh, a, a one dimensional embedding for our users and movies. Uh, next slide, please. If we can add another dimension to our uh, user and item embeddings, then we get a two-dimensional embedding. So in this case, we can add another dimension uh, to indicate whether a user likes a blockbuster movies and whether a movie is a blockbuster movie. So in this case, we have learned we have basically handcrafted a two-dimensional embedding for each user and each movie. Um, next slide, please. Usually, these embeddings are learned automatically uh, through a um, machine learning model instead of being handcrafted. So now, if we denote the embedding, the user embedding table as U and the item embedding table as V, uh, and uh, and uh, we can, uh, if we take the prod the dot product of the the first row of user embedding table and uh, the first column of uh, the item embedding table, then we get a value of 0.88. Which is the top left, uh, top leftmost element in the uh, matrix on the right, which is our predicted uh, feedback matrix. Then uh, we can keep doing this uh, and until we fill up the entire uh, predicted feedback matrix. So now this has become uh, uh, our goal here is to make sure our predicted feedback matrix is as close to the uh, ground truth uh, feedback matrix on the on the left. Uh, as possible. So in this case, this has become a typical uh, supervised learning problem, and uh, you can use different approaches to solve this. For example, uh, stochastic gradient descent, descent to solve this. But there, there are a few uh, challenges with this. One is, uh, you know, movies often have metadata, 
for example, movie genre, uh, release year, and also users have profile information, for example, gender, uh, age, uh, location, those kind of things. Those are valuable information that can help your recommendation model to be more accurate. So how can you incorporate those information into your model? Uh, usually this is done through uh, using a deep neural network and uh, used by using um, um, uh, deep learning models uh, will be helpful to your models. A second challenge is uh, uh, if you have a lot of items to recommend, for example, tens of millions of items, uh, it will be a huge challenge in serving time uh, because uh, your ranking you have to rank those um, uh, items uh, and then select the top most promising items to recommend to your users. Uh, if you have a lot of items, it will be very slow. Uh, usually, production models have a tight latency requirement. So how to make this efficient is a huge challenge, which is uh, why, uh, next slide, please, uh, modern production recommendation models, large-scale recommendation models, uh, usually uh, have this uh, multi-stage pipeline. So usually it will start with a retrieval stage at the beginning, and then uh, that will quickly filter a large pool of candidates down to maybe thousands of uh, candidate items. And then you would pass those thousands of items to the second stage, which is the ranking stage. Uh, the ranking stage will use a more sophisticated model and then uh, filter the, the list even down to maybe hundreds of them. And then in the third stage, which is uh, uh, optional, and uh, uh, it will account for additional metrics such as you know, diversity, fairness, uh, freshness, those kind of things. And then you will uh, further shrink your uh, pool of candidates down to maybe a dozens, a dozens. And then you'll, you will return that smaller list of items to your user. Um, next slide, please. So all this pipeline sounds uh, a little complicated, right? But the good news is uh, Google has open source a library, TensorFlow recommenders specifically designed to help you build end-to-end um, -end, uh, recommendation models. So this is uh, our recommended library to uh, get started with. Um, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it provides a set of components for building, uh, for evaluating and deploying uh, recommendation models. And uh, it will help you, uh, it covers the entire stack from retrieval to ranking. Uh, the library is uh, grounded in years of research and engineering experience in production um, recommendation uh, engine uh, at Google, and uh, it has it is actually powering the um, uh, the major recommendation services in uh, YouTube and Google Play. So, um, so yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we'll walk through a simple uh, retrieval uh, uh, tutorial here, and. Uh, um, with uh, TensorFlow recommenders. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so in this case, we're going to use a standard um, a benchmark data set called movie lens. Uh, basically, here's an example of um, training, training data. Uh, we have a, a movie ID, movie title, and uh, user ID, and also uh, user rating. Um, next slide, please. Uh, movies uh, also have additional uh, metadata such as movie genre. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the first thing we do is uh, we shuffle and split the data training the data set into um, training data set and testing data set, which is a standard machine learning uh, pr practice. Next slide, please. Then we will need to find the unique user IDs and movie titles. Uh, because they are needed when we build up our embedding tables for users and, uh, and uh, movies. So in this case, we are using movie titles instead of movie IDs uh, because movie titles are unique uh, as well. So you, it, it will also work if you use uh, movie IDs as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the model we are going to use a simple is a simple two-tower retrieval model. So remember when we talk about the predicted uh, feedback matrix on the right, we have the user embedding on the one side and then the item embedding on the other side. So basically that's where the two towers come from. You have a user tower and then you have an item tower to learn the uh, embeddings for users and uh, movies. And then we'll take the dot products at the top um, of the embeddings and then we output a prediction. So that's like a basic uh, architecture for this two tower model. Next slide, please. 
so for user power, it's a really simple um, uh, one lay one embedding layer uh, Keras model. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Similarly, for movie tower, it's uh, just we're just using one embedding layer. Next slide, please. For metrics, we're using factorized top K, which is pretty standard uh, metrics for uh, retrieval task. Uh, basically, it means how often a true candidate shows up in uh, the top K uh, um, candidates we recommend. Uh, next slide. And the task is, of course, uh, retrieval, as we mentioned. Next slide. Uh, so we have the towers defined and we have the task and then we're just putting everything together into this uh, single movie lens model subclass from TFRS dot TensorFlow recommenders uh, model. And then next slide, please. And then we, we tell the model how to compute the cost, the loss, uh, which is uh, uh, just takes the embeddings in. Um, next slide, please. So now we have every uh, everything ready and uh, we just compile the model and then we cache the training and testing data set. Uh, next slide, please. And then we can call the familiar Keras uh, feed function. Um, it will start training and uh, the metrics will keep going up. Um, next slide, please. And then we can evaluate the model. Uh, next slide, please. So that's for training. Uh, so at inference time though, we are going to um, build up an index that operates in the movie embedding space. Uh, the index will take in a raw user um, uh, user ID and then transform that user ID into uh, user embedding through the user tower. And then it will look up the closest movie IDs uh, in the embedding space and then return those, uh, return the movie, uh, um, return the movie IDs that are associated with uh, movie embeddings most close uh, most uh, closest to the uh, user embedding in the embedding space and then those will become our uh, recommended movies to the users so that's the idea uh, next slide please to do that we build up a brute force uh, index um, and then uh, next slide please and then we pass in a user id for example 42 here and then the index will return uh, the movies to us uh, so we're using brute force uh, search here, but uh, there, are, there are more efficient approaches um, using approximate nearest, nearest neighbor search. Uh, there will be a talk in about uh, uh, an hour. Uh, my colleagues will go over uh, that, uh, so make sure to stay for that one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, lastly, we can export the model and uh, uh, deploy that into TensorFlow serving for production usage. Um, so that's it. that's uh, the entire um, uh, you know tutorial on uh, retrieval model. Uh, if you are familiar, if once you are familiar with uh, how it works, it will be uh, very similar to build up a ranking uh, component as well. Uh, we'll have a, a my colleague to talk about the TF rank, uh, TensorFlow ranking um, in about half an hour. Uh, next slide. I want to switch gear a little bit to talk about uh, using generative AI um, to build recommendation system. Uh, so we launched a. Uh, um, the uh, generative AI portal and uh, Parma API at Google I.O. So it turns out that you can also leverage uh, large language models to build a recommendation uh, engine as well. Uh, next slide, please. So if you have access to BART, you can directly ask a BART to recommend items for you, uh, as I'm doing here. Uh, it's uh, super easy. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here, if you want to build a similar feature into your own service, you can ask BART. Uh, you can use our um, Parm API chat service to ask the Parm API to recommend movies for your users. Next slide. Another thing you can do is to ask Parm API to uh, make prediction on user rating for uh, particular movies. Uh, for example, here I'm passing a simple prompt and then some example ratings and the Parm API text service will be able to generate additional rating for you as well. Next slide. There's a comprehensive, uh, there's a, a research paper from uh, Google DeepMind team. That they did a comprehensive uh, research and evaluation on how to leverage LLMs to do uh, user rating prediction. Um, so this is a really uh, great paper. Make sure you uh, uh, give it a read afterwards. Uh, next slide. Another thing you can do is to leverage our embedding API, uh, embedding service in the Parm API uh, to, re to recommend, for example, news. 
Uh, for example, if you want to recommend similar news articles to based on what a user is, is reading, uh, what you can do is embed all your news articles, uh, like what I'm doing here, uh, into vectors. And then, next slide. Then you can uh, compute the dot product similarity uh, based on um, what the user is currently reading and the inventory of a news, all the news articles. And then you would use uh, the top K operator from TensorFlow to find the, the nearest, um, the most similar articles in your inventory of uh, news of news articles, and then recommend the most uh, uh, interesting ones, most relevant ones to your users. So that would be uh, using uh, our text embedding uh, API to do uh, recommendation. Next slide. In production, though, uh, your large, if you have a, a sophisticated recommend, recommendation model, your retrieval component will have multiple uh, stage. Uh, your re retrieval uh, uh, stage will have multiple components. You can have a collaborative filtering. Uh, component, and then you can have the text embedding based retrieval component, and then you can add user description uh, and what's trending, like breaking news, those kind of things. And then you mix everything up and pass the candidate pool to your ranking um, uh, uh, stage. Uh, so next slide. So there, are, I uh, there, there's a new blog that got published only a couple of days ago. Uh, there are even more ideas about how to leverage LMs to rec augment your recommendation uh, system. So uh, check check it out when you uh, have a have a time. Uh, next slide. Last thing I want to mention is uh, uh, we launched this unified uh, landing page for recommendation system uh, last year. So this is uh, our one stop shop uh, for all the uh, resources, uh, open source libraries related to recommendation systems. And uh, there are a lot more content than we can cover in the summit. So hopefully you will uh, give that a visit as well. Um, next slide. So that's it from my talk. Uh, so um, this is a, um, um, uh, hopefully uh, my overview will help you uh, to get started. And now we can dive into uh, more technical talks. I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, my colleague Gaber uh, in Zurich to, to talk about how to use uh, TF Agents li Bandis library to do recommendations. Thanks. Hi, Gaber. Hi. Uh, hi. Thank you very much, Wei. Uh, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I'm Gabor. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Zurich uh, in research, sitting in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. I uh, have been here for quite a while now, eight years. And uh, I I co-authored uh, the library that I'm going to talk about. And this library is the TF agent bandits library. And uh, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to explain what what are these things and uh, uh, how they are connected, what do what they have to do with uh, with the recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so reinforcement learning is a, a segment of machine learning where we imagine that an, that an agent is uh, continuously or stepwise uh, uh, communicating with the environment, interacting with the environment, uh, learns from it and makes better uh, decisions while trying to collect some kind of reward uh, in the long term. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about reinforcement learning a lot, uh, but these are just a bunch of applications uh, that you see on this slide where reinforcement learning uh, had huge wins, uh, video games, Go, uh, robotics, uh, even chip design or, or uh, cooling systems. Uh, but uh, there is no recommendation systems there. So I will clear that up in the, in the following slide. Next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, first I'm going to talk about the basics of TF agents, our reinforcement learning library. And then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, multi-arm bandits uh, and what they have to do with the uh, recommender systems. And then we will dive in to the TF agent bandits library and how to use it. What are the main, main entry points and use cases? And then uh, at the end, I will give some pointers if somebody uh, liked it and want to, uh, want to start using it, where to start. Next slide, please. So uh, the TF Agents library is 
uh, is a library within TensorFlow, and it's an open source library, a reliable, scalable, and easy to use library for reinforcement learning and the multi arm bandit. Uh, it's easily accessible and is uh, it's great for learning because it, it's fully decorated with examples, documentation, tutorials, uh, collab files. Uh, and it's also w well scalable. It's, it's well suited for solving complex problems within the reinforcement learning or multi arm bandits. Uh, it's, it's well supported. Uh, we are here to stay. Uh, and the library is well tested. And we might even uh, reply to uh, GitHub uh, bugs as they come. Uh, so it's even worth uh, uh, filing bugs or asking questions there uh, every once in a while. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so reinforcement learning has a lot of moving parts. Uh, in reinforcement learning, we are an agent and we are uh, interacting with an environment. And uh, there is a lot of moving parts and there, is a, uh, there needs to be a lot of objects that, uh, that connect all those things. Uh, there is the environment that gives, uh, next please, uh, uh, the environment that, uh, that gives a context or state. And then after the agent uh, did something, the environment will give a reward. Uh, then there is a policy, next please. A policy is what uh, is a function that decides seeing a state, which might be also called context, uh, decides what action to take. And then there is the agent, next please, that uh, will change the policy, trains the policy based on past data, all the previous uh, states and actions and, uh, and rewards, it collects them and tries to figure out what the next best policy is. Uh, next slide, please. Now, recommender system is a completely different animal. As <laughs> we all know, uh, there is no real surprise on this slide. Uh, as already uh, Ashley and Wei before me said, uh, recommender systems are everywhere. These are just the most common examples you see on the right hand side. Uh, and also uh, listed like videos, apps, products, whatever you can imagine, news articles. Uh, but there is one thing that uh, that comes to at least my mind because this is my area of research, uh, is that whenever you recommend something to a user, you will receive some feedback from that, but you will never receive feedback from recommendation recommended items that you didn't actually recommend. So uh, the important message on this slide is the, we only observe the feedback for the item we recommended. Uh, next, please. So for example, if we recommend the Chrome app, we will know if the user liked it or not based on some click or other interaction. But if there is an app that we didn't recommend, we have no idea. If Maybe we are missing out. Maybe it was a, would have been a great recommendation, or maybe we were right. And uh, we really shouldn't have recommended that item that we didn't. Next slide, please. And this is where contextual multi-armed bandits come into uh, uh, place because multi-armed bandits or MAB uh, is, uh, is highlighting exactly this. So it is a concept within machine learning and, and within that reinforcement learning where at each round, an agent selects an arm or an item or an action uh, after receiving some contextual information like user, uh, or time of day or device or, or features on the items themselves. And then after the, uh, the agent made the decision, uh, it receives a corresponding reward, uh, which the agent wants to maximize in the long run. Uh, and this reward might be click through um, uh, user interactions or even money, and you can see on the right hand side why it's called multi arm bandit. Because uh, in a dream world where uh, where these slot machines actually give you money, uh, there it might be a good idea to figure out if you have a lot of slot machines next to each other, which one has the best payoff function. But when you pull an arm on the on one of the slot machines, you observe what happened, but you don't know what would have happened had you pulled another arm of a, another other slot machine. So you need to figure out how to mix in the prior information on 
average rewards from previous uh, arm pools and when or how to explore uh, actions that you haven't uh, explored enough yet. So maybe you don't know enough about that. And that is really the bread and butter of, of uh, multi arm bandits. The challenge of balancing exploitation and exploration, where exploitation, we call exploitation when we, based on our knowledge of, of the past, we select uh, the action that looks the best and we choose that. Whereas exploration is when we are, we know that we are uncertain of some payoff functions and we want to choose actions that we are uncertain about because maybe we are missing out, maybe th that action is good and in the future we can use that information and collect more data and collect more reward. Next slide, please. Uh, now, okay, now that I, uh, hopefully I cleared up, cleared up why, why TF agents or why uh, multi arm bandits and recommendation systems are siblings and why they need, need each other. Uh, I'll present how to use the TF agents library and within that the, the, uh, the multi-arm bandit directory. So TF agent itself is the reinforcement learning library. And within that, you will find the directory called bandits where lies all the multi-arm bandit stuff. Uh, so there is two main ways of, of using uh, the TF agents bandits. One of them, the easy, easiest way is to look up what algorithms are already implemented uh, and just use them. I will show it on, on uh, soon how to use imp already implemented algorithms or if you feel uh, <clears throat> adventurous or you have some new idea or you have some niche problem that needs a little bit of a change of some algorithms, uh, then you can implement your own algorithm. And I will also show you that it's not, it's not a huge obstacle to jump uh, if you want to implement your own policies and agents. Next slide, please. So the first way, uh, way one, is to use and deploy an, an already implemented algorithm that you can find within TF agents bandits. Uh, it, in the next slide, I will show a list of algorithms, but right now let's just stick to uh, let's say the neural epsilon greedy agent, which is one of our uh, pre-implemented and most successful algorithms. Uh, what you do is after after you installed or or imported the TF agents library, you just say you want to use the neural epsilon greedy agent. So you define your agent. Then you, if if we are looking at the left uh, left hand side panel, uh, if you have some simulated environment in which you continuously can make decisions, receive the rewards, and then change your policy, train your agent, and then go back and make the next decision. In that case, you are also uh, defining your environment, which can be the very famous movie lens uh, uh, data set. Uh, and based on that, we have a, actually a simulated uh, bandit environment. And then uh, you, you also uh, define your driver. The driver is, is uh, the module within TF agents that uh, that connects every all the moving parts together, the environment, the agent, and the policy, and then you just run your driver, and then you will see on TensorBoard uh, what you achieved, and maybe you can change something, some hyperparameters in your algorithm, or if you if you have pre uh, data that you already collected, uh, then you. You don't need an environment. You just define your agent and then call the train function on the agent that will uh, that will train the policy that is within the agent, and then the policy can be used to take actions. Which in most of the recommendation system uh, cases, it's items from a library. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a, a list of uh, bonded algorithms or agents that are popular in the field. Uh, they are ready to use, they are fully tested. Uh, they actually have also uh, regression tests and speed tests. Uh, so yeah, knock yourself out, feel free to try any of these. I'm not going to go through what these algorithms are. Uh, uh, they are popular in the, in the bandit, uh, bandit world, <laughs> so to say. Next slide. So the second main way is to implement your own algorithm. If you didn't find a fitting one uh, or you're, uh, you're uh, adventurous, then you need to define your policy. You need to define a class that uh, subclass is the TF policy. And the main function there you need to write is the distribution function or 
also there is an action function which is based on a context uh, uh, gives the distribution of actions that uh, that the policy takes. And then you have to define uh, your agent, which is a subclass of the of the TF agent, where you where you write down how you train the policy based on past data. And that's it. That's all you have to do. Of course, there are some details hidden. When 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 it, when is that not true? Uh, but it's not that much more complicated than what you see on the right hand side. Next slide, please. Uh, so. The basics of multi bandits it might not be that interesting to recommendation uh, systems, uh, but there are some advanced functionality that can really, really help. Like you can, uh, you can have constraint optimization where you optimize for a reward while not exceeding some constraint, or you can actually optimize for multiple objects, objectives like or rewards. Uh, you can have algorithms that can be ad uh, can adapt to uh, changing environments, like you know people behave uh, in the summer differently than, than close to Christmas. Uh, then you can also, and the, the, the last two items are, are really important, uh, your actions or items can be represented by features. So you don't have to go like movie one, movie two, movie three, but you can represent them with features or embeddings like thriller, uh, longer than an hour, uh, not suitable for children, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and and lastly, and most importantly, we can also rank, which means that you don't only, uh, you, ca you can't just uh, select one item, uh, but you can select multiple ones and rank them uh, like most real life recommendation systems. And on the next slide there, uh, I explain a little bit uh, what to do for ranking. Next slide, please. So when, when you are recommending multiple items, then of course you want to feel more than one item uh, and of course these items when you have thousands of items you represent them by features or embeddings and and uh, you want to increase some kind of business metric let that be say user engagement some kind of user engagement and so you want to put the best items on top and you also want to have a diverse set of elements you don't want to put all thrillers there because maybe the user loves thrillers but uh, Tonight, not in the mood for thrillers, right? Uh, and uh, diversity is a good way to to increase uh, this reward. Uh, and yeah, so these are all the things that the ranking agent in our library can do. Uh, and with that, if you go to the next slide, please. I think I'm almost done. Uh, these are all, and I think I, I hope this the, all these links will be distributed after the event. Uh, these are all the ways you can start interacting with uh, the TFH as the Bandit Library. You can have the tutorials. Uh, uh, you can download stuff from GitHub, uh, and you can have a look at uh, uh, maybe the the blog post that we wrote uh, a couple of months ago. Oh, two years. Oh, yeah, a couple of months. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, if you, I think now, uh, yeah. Now, Ashley will uh, go through some of the questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll help uh, moderate uh, the questions. Oh, you? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Um, so, so yeah, thanks, Gaber, for the for the great talk. And uh, th there are a few uh, audience questions. So, first, uh, um, how do we feed multiple features as context into TF agents, and uh, how can I uh, integrate TensorFlow data loaders into this process? Okay, so yeah, there is two main uh, parts of this question, and I will start with the last one. Uh, I think we have an example somewhere uh, in, in 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 open source that has an integration with uh, the uh, TFX library. Uh, so you can you can leverage all the modules that the TensorFlow Extended has, which is loading, serving, uh, training, uh, testing, evaluating, and TensorBoard and uh, distributed training and all those things. Uh, so yeah, loading, loading a model, loading data uh, can be done this way, or you can just have them, uh, you can do it yourself and, and load your, your TensorFlow data and, uh, and put it in just one long uh, uh, context vector. And you can also batch, uh, like in the, in, in the TF agents library, you can use batching 
at, uh, at serving as well as at training. Now, uh, uh, sorry, what was the other half of the question? Uh, how do I feed multiple features? As yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that I, I answered that half as well. So you, you by multiple features, you, you might mean that uh, you have, say, user features and, and, and device features. You can concatenate them, and that's going to be your context. Uh, yes. or, or if you think the, uh, in the other dimension, if you have multiple examples, you can batch or you can call uh, the agent multiple times. OK, cool. Um, another question is, uh, um, can you elaborate on how uh, TF agents uh, tackle non-stationary environments, uh, which is uh, quite relevant for um, recommendation systems, because there are often like new trends, uh, breaking news, all those kinds of things? How do you yes. do that in TF agents? Yes, uh, so uh, what we're doing is pretty basic. We have, in most of our agents, uh, we have a uh, we have a parameter called forgetting factor uh, that that in its uh, internal representation, which is most of the time uh, uh, a deep, deep neural network, uh, we we make sure that the old examples are are uh, not becoming less and less important, and we give we give uh, maybe yeah with the help of uh, of a learning rate or in the linear case really with this forgetting factor, we make sure that the new examples are more important and the old examples fade away. Yeah, that's, that's all. It's not, not awfully sophisticated. OK, cool. Yeah, thanks, Gaber. Um, and uh, next, we'll, we'll, we'll pass it on to uh, Rolf uh, to talk about uh, TF ranking. Um, obviously, ranking is a, is a quite a critical um, component in the uh, recommendation uh, component, and uh, Rolf will talk all about it. Um, yeah, take it away, Rolf. Yes, uh, thanks, Wei. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Rolf. I'm a software engineer at uh, Google Research, and uh, today I'll be presenting TensorFlow ranking. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so the outline of this talk, I'm first going to give a sort of brief introduction to learning to rank in general. Uh, then I'll talk more about uh, TensorFlow ranking, uh, and go into some technical details uh, and also describe a few use cases uh, where TensorFlow ranking was successful. Um, and then at the end, I'll also briefly mention a new learning to rank library written in JAX, uh, which is called Rex, and then finally conclude. Um, so next slide. Uh, so I'm going to start by giving an introduction to learning to rank. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, ranking is quite a ubiquitous task that appears in many systems, even beyond recommendation systems, but obviously recommendation systems is one of the main ones. Uh, where typically we want to rank items, things like videos or even like uh, items that you're selling or uh, apps in, in like uh, the Play Store uh, in order of most appealing for typically like a specific user or user profile. Um, however, like ranking also appears in other things like search where you would like to rank documents in order of relevancy to a specific query. Um, more generally, we can say that like ranking is the task of ordering a specific set of items uh, for a specific context. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so to make this a bit more uh, specific, uh, what we're really interested in in learning to rank is to learn a function f that can score items uh, in such a way that when you sort the items by these scores, uh, the resulting ranking is optimal. So in this example, we have like four items. We have some function f that's going to score these items uh, together with a context. In this case, the query would be fruit. And then we would ideally have some scores that would put, say, the apple and the kiwi uh, on the top of this ranked list. Right. Um, so next slide. Um, more formally, uh, we can say that um, we have some data set um, containing lists of items. So that's on the left side here, indicated with D, um, where each element in our data set is fundamentally an entire list containing the items that we're interested in ranking, and typically also some labels that tell us how relevant these items are. Um, and you can obtain such logs from, say, click logs, where you just have interaction data from users, and also manually annotated data sets uh, exist, uh, et cetera. Um, then what we can do with such a data is we could take like an instance, like a single learning instance, and pass it through like a function f, say a neural network, um, to get basically score predictions for each of our items. Um, we then also have our uh, relevance labels, this y, um, and then together we can actually compute a loss, right? This is sort of the standard practice of learning a neural network. We're going to do gradient descent with some loss. 
Um, the unique thing about learning to rank is that this loss function is defined on an entire list of items instead of on a single item by itself. Um, next slide, please. So in learning to rank, there's really uh, sort of three uh, main main methods that you could apply. So the first are the pointwise methods, then we have the pairwise methods, and then we have the listwise methods. So the pointwise methods are kind of what you would do if you don't consider the list structure in ranking, uh, where we would just want to apply like a regression or classification technique that you would already have. And you just try to predict for each item independently whether something is relevant or not. Um, Next to that, we have like the pairwise methods, which instead of caring about being able to predict if something is relevant or not independently, um, these methods sort of care more about getting the relative preferences correctly. So they care more about, uh, can I order a pair of items correctly instead of getting a prediction right? Um, and last, we have the listwise methods, which are kind of the state of the art in learning to rank. Uh, these methods consider the entire list of items um, and, and these are definitely more complex loss functions, uh, but they typically provide you sort of the best ranking uh, results. Um, next slide, please. So with that uh, basic learning to rank uh, introduction out of the way, I'm gonna dive into TensorFlow ranking now. Um, so TensorFlow ranking is a, a deep learning library uh, for learning to rank in TensorFlow. Um, it's open source, so anyone can use it. It was released almost like five years ago. Um, it's actively developed in Google Research, and it provides all the functionality that you'll need to build learning to rank models. Most importantly, the ranking losses and metrics, um, but it also provides a number of other functionalities like data loaders, uh, layers, uh, models, etc. Um, next slide. Um, so I'm going to start off by sort of going through a journey of building like a ranking model. So the first thing you want to start with is like your data. So typically in ranking, um, like I mentioned before, what we're interested in is ranking a set of items in response to a context. Um, so this context could be, say, a query, and the list of items are like uh, documents that you're ranking. So in this example, we have uh, this example list with context. It's a protocol buffer format. Uh, we call it ELWC for short. Um, and basically, this allows you to exactly model this type of ranking data. Um, it has a context, which is just a TF example, and it has a uh, examples list, which is a list of these TF examples. Um, and then you can sort of populate your data set like this, um, and you can typically get these from like things like click locks and then populate a data set like this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what TensorFlow ranking provides is a set of functions in the sublibrary data uh, that can take these ELWCs and sort of parse them and turn them into actual tensors that you can then use in a model. Um, an important thing to note here is that the tensors that we're going to generate um, have a, a batch size, a list size, and sometimes also like a feature size. Uh, so they're sort of three-dimensional tensors. And the reason for this is that we have um, this list dimension. We have this list structure in ranking. Um, and uh, an important detail to mention here is that when you're dealing with ranking data, um, you might not always have the same amount of items that you're ranking. So you might have a certain query where you only have uh, three documents that you're ranking and a different case where you only have two. Um, so if you would want to represent this in uh, tensors, then you have to do some sort of padding or some sort of tricks to make this work. So in TensorFlow, ranking takes care of this for you, so you don't have to do this. It will automatically pad items uh, to make sure that this works. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so once we have the data sort of processed and parsed, um, we can just use a regular TensorFlow Keras model. Um, there's a few like TensorFlow ranking specific layers, but you don't really need to use them. Um, and then you can use this model to basically get uh, predictions for your items. So these would be the scores that come out of it. Um, and then given the scores and your uh, relevance labels, uh, you can try to optimize a loss. So you could use any of the TensorFlow ranking losses that are uh, state-of-the-art things like the softmax loss or the approx MVCG loss. Um, all right. Uh, yes, that's the slide I wanted. Sorry. <laughs> OK, go for it. Yes, perfect. Um, so here's a quick code example. Um, basically, the first like uh, line is just importing TensorFlow ranking. Next four lines are um, basically loading a learning to rank data set. Um, this doesn't use uh, the TensorFlow ranking data preprocessors uh, because the data is already processed. So we can just sort of skip that part. And then we can just define a TensorFlow Keras model um, and compile the model with TF ranking specific uh, losses and metrics. Uh, and then we can just call the ordinary like Keras model .fib, and this will then work. You will then you know start optimizing for a specific loss, and you'll also be able to directly see like ranking metrics like NDCG in uh, TensorBoard. 
Uh, next slide, please. So with uh, that sort of out of the way and the technical details, I'm going to go through a few uh, use cases of where we use TensorFlow ranking. Uh, next slide. So the main use cases I'm going to discuss today very briefly are uh, TFR BERTs, uh, unbiased learning to rank, and calibrated learning to rank. Uh, next slide. Um, so first, the TFR BERTs, this was actually published uh, by now like a while ago. Um, basically, what we do here is we are using TensorFlow ranking uh, together with the BERT language model. So we have our data, again, in this example list with context uh, format, where we have a query and some documents. Um, we would then uh, form sort of query document pairs, um, which contain the query and the document text, uh, which can then be fed through like a standard sort of BERT model uh, where we can get the CLS token, which is like an embedding of that query document text, and run that then through an additional sort of scoring function. So that what we end up with is a score for each query document pair that hopefully indicates how relevant the document is for the query. Um, we can then simply apply the TF ranking losses to optimize this thing end to end. So we're not just optimizing the final scoring layer, but we're actually optimizing the BERT model and fine tuning it uh, specifically for a ranking task. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this uh, works particularly well when you have text data. So on the MS Marco leaderboards, um, these results are by now almost a year old. So uh, they might be a bit dated, but they achieved very, very strong performance. Uh, but now I think other language models have definitely overtaken uh, BERT. So there's uh, definitely some changes there now. Uh, but it's still a very powerful model, also on the track COVID uh, data sets. Um, so uh, yeah, very promising uh, stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the second use case I wanted to talk about is uh, unbiased learning to rank. So in unbiased learning to rank, the problem that we're really trying to solve is the problem of position bias. So when you are collecting ranking data, specifically these types of click logs where um, you presented, say, a ranking of items to user and you measured what they clicked on, um, that data is going to be biased uh, because your production ranker has put items in specific locations. So let's say you have like a relevant item and you put it at the bottom of the list. Not many people are going to scroll all the way to the bottom, see it, and then click on it. Whereas if you take a not so great item, but you put it at the top of the list, almost everyone is going to see it and many people are going to click on it. So if you just naively use clicks as your signal um, to, to learn a ranker, uh, you're probably going to end up doing something wrong um, because you're going to incorrectly infer that that, uh, that the item that you had at the top of the rank list uh, is better than some item at the bottom of the rank list, even though that may not be the case. Um, so the field of unbiased learning to rank is uh, quite fast. There's many papers on this topic. Um, broadly speaking, in unbiased learning to rank, there's two ways to sort of solve this issue. Um, the first way is through uh, IPS weighting, which is really um, weighing items in your ranking loss. So you're sort of going to modify your loss function to get rid of this uh, position bias. Um, and the way you do this is by actually building a some sort of model of bias. You need to know what's the observation probability of your items in the ranked list. Um, so that can be quite complicated. Um, the other approach is this two-tower model, where um, we basically try to build a neural network where one side is trying to predict the relevance of an item purely based on the item features. And the other tower is trying to predict sort of the position bias by uh, ingesting position features and then outputting a score. And then you would typically sum these two up and train them jointly. But then when you actually want to serve uh, for, for production, you would only use the serving part. So in this case, the red uh, tower. Um, so next slide, please. So um, we had a paper uh, a while ago, uh, which actually did sort of a more deeper look at this two tower type approach. So in this example, we have like this green part, uh, which is the relevance tower to try to predict the relevance of an item. Um, and the blue part is uh, the sort of very complex uh, examination tower, which try to predict this position bias. Um, in this case, it's not just um, looking at like what position did we put an item. Um, in this case, it's actually using some complex cross attention uh, mechanism uh, to take into account also other items within the list to make sure we get a good model. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we try to run this on the uh, Chrome Web Store um, as an experiment where uh, without debiasing, that's sort of our baseline. Um, then if we just add position debiasing, we get a pretty strong gain uh, to start off with. But then when we add this uh, attention mechanism for debiasing, we get an even stronger performance gain. And one of the reasons is that the Chrome Web Store is displaying items not as a ranked list like one on top of the other, but in a sort of grid view. 
So we need to really take into account sort of the underlying interactions between items in order to correctly model the position bias of the user clicks. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the last thing I wanted to quickly uh, discuss is this use case on calibrated learning terrain. So one unique property of uh, learning terrain methods is that they are usually translation invariant. Uh, what this means is we can take all the score predictions of our model for a particular list of items. And if we shift all of these predictions by a constant, the ranking that we'll get out of it won't actually change because we just added a number to everything. Um, Conversely, also the, the loss function won't actually change. It will not be able to uh, differentiate between shifting by a constant. And the problem here is that if you train the same model twice, you might get uh, predictions that result in the same ranking, but they might be arbitrarily shifted uh, in one way or the other. So the function is fundamentally not calibrated. Um, and in practical scenarios, you typically don't only care about the ranking that comes out of the function, but maybe also the actual values because downstream systems may depend on them. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the idea in this uh, work uh, that we published um, is to derive basically a new uh, ranking loss uh, that shares a global optima with a regression loss. So the fundamental idea is that we decide this cross entropy loss that has this transformation function uh, without going into too much technical detail, you can refer to the paper, but basically we can get a single ranking loss function that is also well aligned with say a regression uh, loss so that we get a calibrated output of the function. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we tried this uh, with some experiments on data from a YouTube search. Um, so as a baseline, we have sort of a sigmoid cross entropy loss, which is just sort of pointwise. It doesn't take into account ranking. Um, and then we just try to add a ranking objective uh, into this loss by adding a, by creating sort of a multi-objective uh, scenario. In this case, we get a good performance increase in terms of NDCG at 10, which is a ranking metric. However, we see that pointwise calibration metrics like AUC uh, drop, which is uh, bad for our system. Um, so if we try this list CE loss, we are actually able to get most of the ranking gain. So we still get a very good NDCG at 10 improvement. Uh, without sacrificing uh, sort of calibration metrics. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, lastly, I'm going to discuss uh, Rex. Uh, next slide. So Rex is uh, actually a new learn, uh, learning to rank library, uh, which is not using TensorFlow, it's using JAX. Uh, it's also open source, so you can play around with it immediately. Um, and it focuses kind of differently than TensorFlow. It focuses more on research and interoperability within this JAX ecosystem. Um, but it's fairly similar to TF ranking in that it also provides ranking losses and metrics. Um, and it also has some new sort of experimental functionality um, that is not there in TensorFlow ranking, but is here in, in Rex. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as a use case, we actually used uh, this new ranking library um, to optimize large language models. So specifically T5, which is developed on the, on the JAX platform, um, we are able to optimize this specifically for ranking tasks, for, for text ranking, uh, where we can take an encoder, decoder, large language model, uh, add in one of these ranking losses and try to optimize uh, sort of the final ranking performance. And specifically here, we used something called a poly one softmax loss, uh, which was able to get very strong uh, performance for, for ranking tasks. Um, next slide, please. So with that, I'm, I'm going to wrap up uh, for the conclusion. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, ranking is really like a core part of many real world systems. Um, TF ranking uh, is a library that has existed for some time now. It provides state-of-the-art ranking losses, metrics, and infrastructure, uh, which actively used both in the research world but also in real-world systems, and has sort of batteries included. It contains everything, data loaders, losses, uh, models even, and handles a lot of the complexity of ranking. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, sort of technical details that are under the hood that are sort of difficult to get right. Um, and I gave you some examples, including like BERT, position debiasing, calibrated learning to rank, et cetera. I also presented to you Rex, which is a relatively new library focused on the JAX ecosystem. And unlike TensorFlow Ranking, we, this library doesn't really focus much on the real world system, but more on research and, and large language models, where we see uh, an uptick in uh, the uses of JAX. Uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Uh, and I guess we can take some questions if there's time. Yeah, um, thanks, Rolf. Uh, that, that was a great uh, uh, and insightful talk. Uh, so here's one question. Uh, what kind of ranking methods, uh, point-wise, pairwise, or list-wise, uh, is uh, uh, typically appropriate for recommendation systems? Uh, I guess when you start, uh, when you're just getting started, it, it, there's a lot of metrics and approaches. How do you recommend 
or advise people to uh, use at the beginning? Right, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so typically a good way to start is to start with pointwise approaches because they are the most simple and you sort of understand what's going on. They're, they're like regression or classification approaches. Um, if you have click logs, um, typically the softmax loss, the listwise uh, softmax cross entropy loss is a very powerful one to start with as well. It's quite robust to different things. Um, if you're looking to optimize a specific metric, like say MDCG, um, there's this family of methods called approximate metric optimization. So there's some of these losses as well in flow ranking, something like approx MDCG. As so if you're interested in optimizing those specific metrics, uh, I do recommend looking at uh, approx MDCG, for example, um, because that should be better at specifically optimizing those metrics. Um, but if you're just starting out and you're just trying something simple, I would recommend start with pointwise and then sort of move your way up. Uh, through pairwise and then list ones. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, another question is, uh, what's the long-term vision for racks and uh, TF ranking? Uh, how should I choose one uh, over each other, over the right. other? Uh, yeah, that's also a good question. So uh, the TF ranking library is really uh, battle-tested, used in uh, production. So it's it's definitely here to stay. Um, it's, uh, it's a strong library um, that has sort of all the tools you need. So if you're building practical systems, I definitely recommend you know, using TF ranking. Rex is more of an experimental uh, type of library where we can try crazy ideas uh, within the JAX ecosystem. So if you are using JAX, then it makes sense to use this. Um, and especially if you're like in research and you want to try really sort of crazy stuff, then uh, this can be helpful. But uh, if you're building an actual practical system, uh, definitely TF ranking. And, Going forward, uh, we'll continue to support both libraries uh, in the future. So, yeah. okay, yeah, I think uh, uh, I think we're at time for this talk. Uh, thanks again, Rolf, for the great talk. Um, Thank you. Cool. Now we'll move on to the next talk uh, for scalable uh, retrieval by my colleague Jordan and uh, Jeremy. Uh, take it away, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Wade. <clears throat> Hey everyone, uh, so my name is Jordan Totten. I'm a machine learning uh, specialist in the retail CPG vertical at Google Cloud. And uh, here's my colleague, Jeremy. Yeah. Hi everybody, uh, Jeremy Wirtz. I'm a colleague of Jordan as well. Um, and today, really excited to talk with you about scaling deep retrieval with TensorFlow. So before we dive into this a little bit to give you a little bit of context, uh, Jordan and I are both customer engineers. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk a little bit about story about how we developed uh, this use case and assets, uh, started with a customer and developed into an example that we'll share for the sake of uh, teaching you all how to scale up massive retrieval. So to go to the next slide, please. So the story starts uh, really where we've been talking about before in these prior sessions. We're, 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 where we're thinking about now is open source. We're talking about TensorFlow. And the timeline goes back to 2015 when you know, uh, Google has developed TensorFlow and further extended it out over the years to uh, provide things like TensorFlow recommenders, Kubeflow, and other architectures. Uh, the piece that we're going to focus on today is going to take us a little bit off TensorFlow recommenders, but it's a perfect um, complementary technology to TensorFlow recommenders, and we'll explain why, which is called the matching engine. So Google Research has started out with TensorFlow. Like I said, they built up great uh, solutions with neural architecture search. And uh, they finally came up with a really uh, interesting uh, algorithm that's called uh, the scan, uh, the scan uh, uh, algorithm that provides a nearest neighbor's algorithm to recall uh, potential candidates that you're using inside of a two tower architecture. So that paper ended up uh, getting published, uh, was well received. Uh, there was a lot of very uh, uh, compelling benchmarks on performance of that technology. We'll talk about what that means. And eventually that was uh, came out and formed out in the product that we have on our Vertex AI platform called Matching Engine. So we're going to talk a bit about Matching Engine today in context of TensorFlow recommenders and different things. So if we go to the next slide. The way that this kind of fits in uh, is, is a really nice uh, dovetail to what we talked about in the previous discussion. We see right here that we're talking about ranking. And it was really uh, well dis discussed in terms of you can go end to end with uh, ranking 
right? In terms of uh, starting with your, your model and going all the way to a final result just from the last presentation. But there's sometimes situations where, and think of things like, you know, Google, uh, YouTube, uh, just, just large online companies that have large catalogs of items. If you have millions, billions of items that are potential products that you want to recommend or experiences or personalization arms that you want to pull on a multi-arm bandit, you, you have to sort through that haystack in an efficient amount of time because if you don't, you're going to use uh, brute force and it's going to uh, scale essentially linearly with the amount of items that you have inside. So we're going to talk about two stage uh, recommendation systems, not to be confused with two tower, very confusing. And this is the situation where the architecture is broken into two parts, one in the red over there on the left, where retrieval is handled to um, be super, super fast and super efficient. And then rankings handled on the back end. So in order to do that, you have to have a uh, vector store technology to help you uh, sort through these things in an efficient way using uh, um, approximate nearest neighbors. And that's where matching engine comes into play. So next slide, Jordan. Yeah, so, you know, why do we need a serving index and why do we need um, approximate search? Um, so we'll, we'll step through a couple slides here to kind of illustrate this point. Uh, next slide. So in retrieval, we have query items. Um, it could be an image, uh, like you see here, image in this shoe. And the goal is to query a large database um, in such a way that the query results uh, return items that are more similar to the query than any other items in the database. So next, next slide. And one approach is to calculate the similarity between uh, the query item and all the items in the database. Um, so this would be an exhaustive search or brute force. And this quickly becomes infeasible with large data sets. And there's likely um, a lot of wasted computation because typically just a subset of the database is relevant to our query. So next slide. So a critical component for um, an approximate search is an index structure that's optimized for efficient retrieval. So one that divides the data set into subsets um, so that we can limit the search to a subset of candidate items and get sublinear uh, retrieval. So this all means that we need to build an index that orients similar items closer to each other. And we can define what that um, similarity is um, through co-occurrence uh, of items. So it could be items that are purchased together. It could be visually similar items like you see here, you know, wear some uh, shoes that look like this shoe. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you could take this, um, so, but it all uh, gets down to how we structure um, this index for serving. Next slide. And uh, so vector similarity search provides a way uh, for us to represent complex relationships between multiple entities. And Vertex Matching Engine uh, is a managed solution uh, for indexing these entities. It's a managed uh, implementation of SCAN. Um, so we can take some data, like, like you see here on the left, it could be any modality. Um, the pairs could be multimodal. Um, it could be text to image, um, you know, really anything. And we use a deep learning model, um, an encoder, uh, to generate uh, the embedding vector representation of these items. So in the case of uh, visual similarity, uh, we could really just take a pre-trained ResNet, pop the last layer off, and then we're computing the embeddings for um, any item that we would feed through that pre-trained model. We can also build um, you know, our own model, a two-tower from scratch, to produce these um, embedding vectors. And, you know, doesn't matter like which model we use, as long as we get those embedding vectors, um, these can be uh, indexed in our serving index and in, in vertex matching engine. Um, and this is what we can use to serve uh, these items in low latency in a production application, for example. The next slide. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, how Matt, well, we'll get into matching engine, how it works in the next slide, but we'll get into why it's important and, and how the speed comes into play. So as Jordan said, it's it takes a lot of time to uh, look through these in a brute force nature, and there's a lot of other competing algorithms out there. 
So we try to uh, provide a little bit more edge in the performance with our algorithms. I'll explain how that works. There's a bit of math behind that. But if you focus on this uh, chart on the right, it's, it's busy, I know, but it tells the story of SCAN, which is Matching Engine, our managed service, uh, compared to a lot of other uh, open source implementations like the, uh, the Facebook, Facebook implementation or the uh, Solar implementation with HNSW. And essentially what, what you see is that purple line, which is Matching Engine, uh, has significantly higher uh, recall uh, for this particular benchmark, and this was from the original research, uh, compared to the speed. So if you just say, look at one example, just kind of carve a vertical line through 90% accuracy, you notice that we can achieve 7,000 queries per second, as opposed to solar achieving about 2,500. How do we how do we do that? Well, we do it in a couple different ways. One, we partition out the different vectors. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the uh, if you read the paper, uh, it's, it's uh, available. It's called Accelerating Large Scale Inference with Anastropic Vector Quantization. It, it's got some really neat math tricks that breaks down the loss uh, to uh, the loss of the various uh, embeddings with itself to maximize the total amount of information, thus the total amount of recall that you get back in those results. So let's go to the next slide to break down a little bit of how that works. And I won't go super deep in the math, but it's it's uh, it's, it's quite clever. So um, what we offer up is first we take the embedding space, that cloud that you've, this could be your pictures, it could be your pictures plus your music, it could be any, any form of um, data that's embedded. And then we go through and provide uh, centroids that will cluster out that space into a bunch of different spaces. Now that's where a lot of the competition and a lot of the different algorithms tend to stop. They'll do some things on top of that, but we do one more thing inside of the leaf partitions and we do a rescoring. And so that's when it goes back to that orthogonal loss. And there's a really neat internal algorithm that tries to find the best minimal representation of that total candidate space. And it tries to find uh, essentially the representative code words that can be used to calculate the anastrophic loss and thus score each one of these to have the best results that gives the most information. So uh, we're talking about maximizing inner product, which is equivalent to providing uh, maximized information for recall. So went a little deep there, but it's, it's, uh, it's all to say that there's some uh, great additional math secret sauce. It's not secret, it's open source. If you want to check it out, um, the performance is, is amazing at a, at a very large scale. Go to the next slide. So uh, yeah, Jordan, uh, I'll transition this over to you and then could you maybe start us out real quick with the context on where this started with a customer? Yeah, I first just want to uh, acknowledge that you nailed that white paper uh, title. Uh, I don't think I could have could have done that, <laughs> the, pronouncing that. Um, yeah, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so we created um, this end-to-end -end example um, that uses the publicly uh, available uh, data set called a Spotify Million Playlist data set. And we use this data set for a couple of reasons. And the first is that, you know, this stuff is hard. And we had some customer teams who still needed help building their own retrieval models and pipelines from scratch. And we wanted to pick a, data, a different data set than the ones that were used um, in the TFRS docs. And this was helpful because the users could try to implement the same concepts in the docs with a different data set. So this provides a good uh, reference point to see uh, the same techniques applied to different data sets, uh, but it also provides good opportunities to discuss why some things uh, might need to change on a different data set, which is exactly what will happen when trying to implement um, in production on their data set, and exactly what will happen over time with even the same data set. Um, so another advantage to uh, using this data set is that most people can at least relate to or are at least familiar with many of the tracks and the kinds of names that people choose for playlists, uh, you know, what are beach vibes versus forest vibes, things like that. Um, and so they can ideally be able to better interpret the retrieved candidates um, and especially when you're comparing those across different model configurations and training procedures. Um, and then most importantly, many people can relate to or have experience with the user experience and the prediction task that we're, that we're really trying to solve. And 
you know, that's really hard to replace. And this kind of context can go a long way um, in a lot of the decision making that needs to be made um, or considered and tested throughout the development cycle. Um, and then the last point um, is that this data set also has, um, let's say, a healthy variety of data types, uh, which include lists and, and nested data structures. Um, there's also a Spotify developer API that we can hit to further enrich this data set with track metadata, um, like the audio profile. There's like 11 or 12 uh, features um, related to the audio uh, profile of each, each track, like what's the timber, the mode, the key. Um, and then you can grab things like the artist genres. Um, and then we even included some code uh, to be able to hit your own Spotify account um, and generate recommendations for um, your playlists, which really means that you can go on the app and easily create any combination of seed tracks and see how they relate to the training data. Um, so that was a really interesting exercise that we did. Um, and it's just really, it's really, um, you know, provides a good um, conversation starter or a point to start discussing these other, you know, deep topics of, um, you know, retrieval. Uh, next slide. And we've seen a little bit about two towers today and had some good explanations before. So um, you can just think of, you know, here, you know, as any, any pairs of queries and candidates can be, uh, you know, any kind of data type here. We're, we're saying playlist um, are our queries. And then the next song, uh, the track that we want to recommend um, is are our candidates. Uh, next slide. Um, and so one thing that you'll see in that code repo, if you take a look, um, is a lot of work that we did in BigQuery. Um, BigQuery made this, uh, a lot of the data prep um, and, and the data processing really easy because it can handle nested uh, data structures really well. Um, there's a uh, capability in there to just, at, at, with a click, uh, convert a BQ table to TensorFlow records. Um, so it spins up a data flow pipeline, which is a managed service of uh, Apache Beam um, and converts uh, these, you know, large tables to uh, TensorFlow records uh, very quickly. So I think we had um, like 65 million uh, training examples. Um, and I think that these these pipelines took maybe like 30 minutes uh, to convert all those to TF records. So really, really impressive there. And so what we did um, to kind of create our training data set, um, as you can see here in the example, is we would have all the original playlists, and then, you know, maybe we, we would just pop off the last track and make that a candidate track. And then we did some variants where we, we popped the last five off and we made it, you know, multi-class or multi-label um, prediction test. So a lot of flexibility that and freedom that you have here to kind of um, construct your, your pairs. Um, and those should really mirror, um, you know, what you're trying to solve or achieve um, in your user experience. Uh, next slide. All right, so I'll, I'll cover this one real quick, uh, the tower architecture. And th this is actually what got our customer very excited because what they actually wanted to use was multimodal embeddings. And to use multimodal embeddings is very easy. What I mean by that is just taking embeddings from like product pictures, you have audio, other things from other systems, other models. So um, the uh, architecture of the bottom of one of these towers, we've kind of talked about broadly, we've seen some code. We see a visual of you know the data flowing from the bottom, the raw data. Think of that as like the big query data that we just saw. And, I, and we wanted to provide a quick example of uh, the various ways you would transform data as it comes in. So it obviously handles all the scalar uh, tensor values. And if it's a short string, you, know, you want to be able to do the NLP and you do the text vectorizer and add your embedding layers on there. If it's an ID, you do a hashing layer. Uh, if it's a list of strings, uh, you do text vectorizer and you do it as a two-dimensional, which by the way, at the top, you have various convolutional layers. This is the part that, that was all complicated. This is the part I love that's simple, which is if you have a picture from somewhere else, put it at the bottom of this tower and bring it all the way up to this concatenated tower. And what's at the top, all the rest of it is just deep connected layers. You can configure it however you want. Uh, in our case, we did uh, a, a deep, uh, deep network, deep cross network in this particular implementation. Uh, so, just want to give you a, a view into that, and also plug for future. Uh, I think we got a, a 
session on dynamic embeddings that that would actually make this system a lot better so excited uh, about hearing about that one coming up here soon so Duran, i'll go back to you to close it out on the next couple slides here so um yeah if we can go to the next slide um so the key to scaling retrieval um it really comes down to decoupling the inference of query and candidate representations so in terms of uh, production applications with low latency requirements. Um, the advantages of models like two tower are mainly uh, twofold. So the candidate tower allows us to support um, an arbitrary set of candidates. So we don't need to include fresh items or fresh tracks um, in the training vocab. We can leverage a, a trained candidate tower to compute their embeddings um, from their track features, their metadata, and this essentially gets at solving the cold start problem. And the second is um, that embeddings of all the track candidates can be pre-computed and indexed uh, via matching engine or scan, um, and thus enable uh, fast inference at serving time. And this is where the training and serving starts to deviate from traditional ML models. So we're actually training two models that will be used separately at different times. So the decoupling uh, inference of the towers for retrieval means that we can pre-compute what we want to find uh, when we encounter its pair in the wild. Um, this also means that we can optimize each inference task differently. So we could run a batch prediction job uh, with a, a trained candidate tower to compute all the embedding vectors for all the known candidates, and we can attach a deep, uh, TPU or GPU to accelerate this computation. And then we can compress uh, those pre-computed candidate embeddings to an ANN index um, that's optimized for low latency uh, retrieval, and then deploy that index to an endpoint uh, for serving that has its own uh, uh, machine configuration. And then we can deploy the trained query tower to an endpoint um, for converting the queries to embeddings in real time. And we can attach you know, a different size GPU to accelerate this computation um, as well. So. Um, during training, you know, there, these two models are trained together to learn um, a common embedding space. And, you know, hopefully and ideally throughout that training, they learn to associate these queries and candidates in the same um, embedding space. And so that a, we know that the playlist or the embedding uh, vector representation of a playlist um, can lead us to the embed embedding uh, vector representation of potential candidate tracks to recommend. And if we go to uh, the next slide. Yeah. So, and, yeah, go ahead and go ahead and take this one, Jeremy. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about future work. So now we're shifting to a completely different topic, but still related to matching engine. So that was, you know, we have a lot of references we'll provide on the next slide. Uh, if you want to see the repo, more questions. The exciting thing that I think is kind of prepping for this next session and the next few sessions are a lot of our customers are now wanting to use matching engine as a means to store unstructured data uh, uh, in conjunction with tools like generative AI. And there's a new concept called agents and where you can ask an agent a natural language question and it does thinking, you can access all these indices and start to make sense of things. So Jordan, you want to walk through that example that, that we have on the screen? And then I think that's that's our final slide. Yeah, I mean, really the idea is that um, like the index that we kind of talked about, um, the, the two types of indexes that we talked about here in the beginning, it was, uh, you know, visual similarity. So like how are all my items uh, related to each other just based on how they look? And then there's how are all my items related to each other based on their co-occurrence uh, which could be, um, you know, sales transactions, or it could be, um, you know, their appearance on on playlists. And so, when you're using these agents with large language models, and you have, um, let's say, like a, a, a QA chatbot to um, understand or un better understand your product set, or you want to have it in a search uh, function or ca capability, um, or have it serving recommendations, these agents can access different indexes. Um, in a plan and execute fashion, um, you know, for different parts of, of the retrieval. And so all of the um, information retrieval themes and patterns that we discussed um, in the previous slides still apply to this. 
Um, and now we're able to augment those with uh, these large language model agents and um, the results and the capabilities are, are pretty cool. So this example here is just, um, we actually scraped a lot of uh, data from GDEL, uh, which is um, a Google jigsaw project uh, that has 15 minute uh, updates of all the news um, that's published around the world. And we scrape all of that into, we scrape all of the articles that are listed in those records um, and then just start asking questions um, about a, um, an actor of interest, whether that's a company or you know, any kind of noun really. Um, and so very easily, I mean, these pipelines took, uh, I think about 30 minutes and we can just start asking questions like, you know, what are the top news items for this actor and how can they impact their brand perception? Um, and then from there we start uh, retrieving information that can be synthesized from multiple documents um, and then provide this in a concise answer. And I think where this really shines um, is for, you know, users who might be non-technical, but are business experts. And we want to kind of accelerate that um, development cycle of, you know, an expert uh, non-technical business person uh, interfacing with a technical, you know, maybe data analyst and all the back and forth that they might have had to do, you know, six months ago. And now we can we can help that non-technical business person uh, get answers um, uh, faster or to kind of give them information to, um, you know, prepare and then go to that data analyst to get, uh, you know, more data. So uh, a lot of exciting stuff here and um, excited for the next talks here that, that uh, dive into this too. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and that that's it. So we have um, you know the link to a blog here that kind of explains uh, this code repo that's also uh, linked here. And there's uh, you know notebooks that you can run to go through there, and then also all the source code that is uh, that's also there too. All right. Uh, thanks, to Jeremy and Jordan. I think we are a little bit running behind the schedule, so we'll, we'll pass the uh, Q&A. Uh, for those uh, viewing uh, our uh, summit right now, uh, well, you know, we saw your questions on the uh, our, our, on our platform. We'll answer that in the uh, chat sec in the uh, Q&A section uh, um, offline. And then right now we'll pass it over to our um, uh, research team, uh, Mahesh and uh, Nikhil, to talk about their new and very exciting uh, generative virtual approach. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, Vey. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mahesh, and I'm here with Nikhil. Uh, both of us are from Google DeepMind. We are extremely excited to share our work on um, using generative modeling for improving recommender systems. Uh, actually, thank you to Jeremy and Jordan for setting up the stage for us. Uh, so this work has been in, done in collaboration with lots of great folks across Google. And today, the two of us will present a brief overview of our work. You can find more details um, about this work and this paper linked here. So here, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, he, here is the um, overview of uh, what, what we will present today. We will give an introduction to recommender systems and how our work fits in this uh, context. Uh, followed by describing how we uh, our novel way of representing uh, items using something called semantic IDs. And then uh, we describe our generative retrieval setup for sequential recommendation that you know uses these semantic IDs, followed by results and uh, Q and a. Uh, next slide, I uh, pass it to Nikhil for uh, the introduction. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh... So uh, as you have seen in the previous talks, uh, the recommendation stage typically involves two stages, uh, retrieval and ranking. So given some form of user query, uh, we, the, we retrieve top K candidates uh, in the first stage, um, and then the ranker model outputs a rank list of items which can be served to the user. And this talk uh, specifically focuses on the retrieval model for recommendations. Um, and by query features, we'll be using user and contextual features. And the objective here would be to retrieve top K candidates that can be used later for ranking. Next slide, please. So we, we'll focus uh, um, on the retrieval stage in the sequential recommendation task. Uh, so in sequential recommendation, we typically have a sequence of items that the user has interacted with uh, in the user session. 
Uh, and the goal now is to retrieve candidates for the next item that the user is likely to interact with. So uh, for example, in this case, we have like an orange shoe with uh, some brand X and, and there is uh, an atomic sparse feature, uh, ID feature, which is 233 for the first item. And, uh, and similarly, we have another uh, red shoe brand Y as the second item. And we are predicting uh, the, the goal is to predict the next item that the user is likely to interact with. Next slide, please. So uh, current state-of-the-art methods, uh, retrieval methods typically use dual encoders, uh, where two architectures are, are learned for the retrieval stage, where in the first uh, architecture, which is the user encoder, the input is the sequence of item IDs, uh, which are again sparse features. Uh, and the output for this architecture is a user embedding. Uh, and then we have a candidate encoder, uh, which takes the candidate item features as the input and uh, outputs and item embedding. These two architectures are trained uh, using the inbat softmax class. Um, and then there is a, 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 an index created using all the items in the corpus uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, embedding space. And during inference, we use these candidate, embed candidate embeddings for, uh, to find the nearest neighbor uh, in the learned embedding space. A few things to note uh, about dual encoders uh, is that this is a two-stage process. Uh, first, we are training two encoders. And then after training, an index is built using all the candidate embeddings. And the second observation here is that the item and user feature embeddings only interact in the final layer of these models. And finally, the user preferences are typically modeled using a single user embedding for retrieval. Uh, which can become a bottleneck for users which have very diverse interests. Next slide, please. So in this work, we are proposing a new single stage for retrieval where the transformer memory is used as an implicit index for retrieving candidates. Now, to build this index using transformer memory, we propose using a semantic representation for items. And we call this representation a semantic ID for the item. A semantic ID is composed of a sequence of semantic integers. For example, in this illustration, we have uh, 5, 23, 55 as the semantic ID for uh, the first item, which is an orange shoe brand X. Um, and we generate this semantic space such that similar items tend to have the same semantic ID prefix. So given these semantic IDs for the items in the user session, a generative model is learned to generate the semantic ID of the next item that the user is likely to interact with. Next, um, I'll hand over to Mahesh, who will discuss the details on how semantic IDs are generated um, and how we can use this for generative retrieval. Oh, thanks, Nikhil. Next slide, please. Um, so as uh, Nikhil mentioned, uh, the generative retrieval works on the semantic space. And so our goal is to design uh, some sort of uh, semantically meaningful IDs for each of the item rather than using the you know, opaque uh, item IDs. So for this, uh, what we do is we take the content information uh, for each of the items, such as the title, description, and so on, and pass them through a content encoder, which outputs an embedding, which basically has a semantic meaning for the item. And then this embedding, we pass it through a quantization stage, which generates the set of tokens that uh, Nikhil showed before. Uh, so this, this basically is our semantic ID. And we also make sure that in case, uh, uh, we, we make sure that all uh, items have unique semantic IDs. Uh, next slide, please. So, now here uh, we show how we actually uh, do the you know, uh, ge generate the semantic IDs using a model called RQVAE. So RQVAE is a variant of uh, VQVAE, and it uh, basically maintains the it, it performs a hierarchical quantization, uh, which is useful in kind of uh, uh, capturing the meaning of the items. So the way this works is uh, we take the embedding that uh, we showed in the previous slide and pass it through a DNN encoder. Uh, which generates the uh, which generates an uh, embedding uh, or a vector, which we compare against uh, some of the vectors that we maintain in a code book. And uh, once we find the closest neighbor, uh, we, we kind of find the difference between uh, the output of the DNN encoder 
and this vector, and that's the residual. We kind of uh, repeat this process of matching with the code book multiple times, and all the matches, the index of the matches, represent our uh, semantic IDs. Uh, and this is basically how we, uh, we we train this model, and this is how we generate the semantic IDs for all the items. And this is just uh, done once. Uh, and next slide, please. So uh, yeah, here we show kind of how um, um, the semantic IDs are uh, capturing the meaning. So on the left side, we show a distribution of uh, you know the, the probabilities based on the prefix. Uh, so 0, 1, 2, 3 for the semantic IDs on a specific Amazon Beauty data set. And uh, we can actually see that uh, prefix 3, for example, captures a uh, lo lot of products that are related to hair. Uh, and, and actually, the, uh, the, the categories that are mentioned here are ground truth uh, labels that we have in the data set. And on the right, we have similar set of figures for uh, subsequent indices and this basically is a way for us to show that uh, the semantic ids are further uh, um, um, basically partitioning the uh, space of items uh, next slide please and uh, next slide so here we uh, show how we use standard transformer encoder decoder models to build our uh, generative retrieval setup the encoder model here is um, um, it takes as input the query features. So we give uh, the, the user feature and uh, history, the semantic ID of the interaction history for the user. And sees, since these are all uh, just tokens, we basically tokenize it and uh, pass it through the encoder. And the decoder auto regressively generates the semantic ID or basically these tokens for the next item. And note that uh, you know we, we can use beam search to to, to generate uh, 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 a number of candidates that we need uh, for for retrieval setup. And with that, I will hand it over to Nikhil. Uh, next slide, please, to talk about uh, some results. Yeah, thanks, Mahesh. Uh, now we'll show some results on public benchmarks. Um, so this uh, table basically shows uh, three public benchmarks. The first one is sports and outdoors. Uh, the second one is beauty, and third one is toys and games. So all of these are different benchmarks within the Amazon review data set. Um, on the first column, we have uh, the prior uh, dual encoder-based uh, methods. And in the final row, we have uh, the uh, method that we propose, uh, generative retrieval, where we are using a transformer architecture with semantic IDs. And the evaluation here is based on the recall and the NDCG metrics. Um, and as you can see in this table, we show that generative retrieval can uh, see significant gains compared to existing uh, dual encoder-based uh, approaches. Um, and this was consistent across uh, all of these benchmarks. Next slide, please. Uh, another interesting thing with generative retrieval is that we can, uh, the generative retrieval allows us to control uh, recommendation diversity so this can be done by temperature-based decoding. Um, and we can control the diversity at various levels of item granularities. So uh, for instance, uh, let's take the transformer decoder block here. Um, in this case, the output uh, semantic ID is 5, 25, and 55. So let's say we want to control the diversity at sec second le level of granularity. And we can do that by uh, controlling the temperature parameter when we uh, when we use uh, when we sample from the softmax probabilities. So higher temperature can lead to more diverse categories, and a lower temperature can lead to less diverse categories. Um, as a qualitative example, uh, in this table uh, at the bottom of this slide, in the first column we have the ground truth target category that the user has clicked. And in the second and the third column, we are showing the uh, categories that the model has predicted uh, for different temperature values. So if you, if you see the, uh, the third column, temperature uh, where the temperature is 2, we will see that uh, not only the model predictions have the ground truth category, the model is also predicting items from categories that are very similar um, and which can lead to more uh, engagement uh, over time. Next slide, please. 
another interesting thing with generative retrieval is that it allows us to do cold start retrieval. So with semantic IDs, uh, we can retrieve newly added items to the system using prefix matching. So given a new set of fresh items, we can generate their semantic IDs using the RQVAE model that Mahesh uh, presented, and we can store their corresponding semantic IDs uh, in our data set. And once the model predicts the next item semantic ID, we can use prefix matching in semantic ID space to retrieve new items added to the system. So on the right, uh, on the slide, we show a, a plot where uh, we are comparing uh, our generative retrieval approach with another baseline, which is based on uh, semantically uh, semantic k nearest neighbors. And we are comparing the result across two different item splits. So the solid line here is the, uh, is the recall performance on the entire item data set. And the dash line here is the recall performance on the specific newly added items, uh, like recall on that item split. And for both these splits, we see that generative retrieval approach does much better than uh, this baseline and, uh, and also shows promises, promise for cold start retrieval here. Um, next slide, please. Um, with that, um, I would like to thank you and open the floor for any questions. Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, great talk. And uh, uh, for the audience, I also want to quickly mention that uh, Mahesh and uh, Nikhil are also the uh, co-authors co co for the uh, pre user prediction or rating, or user rating prediction uh, paper I, re I referenced at the beginning of the talk, the event. So they have, uh, they have been very productive in <laughs> producing papers. So um, one question for you guys is, um, uh, so this this approach, new approach, sounds very exciting. And uh, uh, do you foresee any uh, barrier to deploy this into production usage? Um, so th this is definitely a, uh, that's a great question. So uh, this is a research project. Uh, one issue with generative models in general is that they are quite expensive. Uh, so th that could be something that we need to work out. Uh, but thankfully. You know, th there is a lot of work across the generative AI community, which is making all these uh, generative modeling, transformer-based models, uh, kind of cheaper to do. For example, um, you know, all the quantization-related work. So, uh, yeah, th that can be a barrier, but thankfully, you know, people are, are working on that. Yeah. Great. Um, another question is: uh, so, for for your for this research, you were using. I guess sentence T5 for the uh, encoding. Uh, yes. Do you think uh, it will make the results even better if uh, even more powerful uh, LM, for example, PARM, are used in this case? Um, yeah, yeah, quite, quite possibly. Uh, we, we didn't test with uh, some of the newer uh, models. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, the, 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 the better the semantics that we capture with the embeddings, the you know, be better the result should be. But yeah, we, we do expect it's not going to make things much better so that there may be some sort of a diminishing returns still. That's a interesting research uh, or future work that uh, we can do. All right, okay, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, now I think, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to our next talk uh, to uh, Babahav and uh, Americ to talk about the uh, TBU embeddings. Thank you, Wei, and uh, hi, everyone. My name is Babhav. Uh, I'm a product manager for Cloud TPUs here at Google Cloud, and I will be uh, presenting this uh, talk on TPU embedding API with my uh, colleague, Aymeri Damian from Snap. And without further ado, let's dive right in. So I guess uh, what I heard in the past few hours, we don't need to uh, really explain what is an embedding, but uh, needless to say that it is a mapping of a discrete object into dense vector space and not just any mapping but a mapping that makes sense for a certain task so oftentimes for these tasks we care for composability and semantic similarity of uh, words in this case uh, king uh, and man and women uh, 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 set of semantic embedding were such that these combinations lead to the embedding of queen which uh, gives us the confidence that the 
representation that we have learned does make sense. And since then, there have been really interesting applications. Can we go uh, to the next slide? Uh, you also heard in the talks uh, uh, today about two tower architecture where there is a query and the uh, 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 database tower. And then uh, during training, we train these towers to learn similar uh, set of embeddings. And uh, you know during uh, serving, we uh, want to leverage this in order to be able to look up a, a certain query and find out the nearest uh, neighbor for that specific query. Next slide, please. So uh, when we talk about all these embedding tables, uh, typically it is in context of recommendation model, but it is not limited to recommendation models. But we are going to, for the talk today, focus on recommendation models only. So one of the characteristic of such models is that there are lots of categorical features which means that there are lots of uh, uh, set of embedding tables of variable sizes uh, that you have to deal with. And these tables also imply the uh, lookup operation, which are of low uh, compute density. So since by nature, these are sparse. And they also tend to be memory bandwidth intensive. And since uh, there are large number of categorical features, we can also expect to have a large memory footprint. And another characteristic is that oftentimes these are uh, uh, so much or so many that it doesn't fit the uh, on-chip memory uh, for a single accelerator chip. So, uh, and also uh, other set of suboptimalities in that path, typically if it is not uh, uh, specifically optimized is that the uh, table lookup operations are done in series because these typically form the earlier layers of your model. And then uh, the downstream computations are not easily overlappable. And uh, also for systems which uh, work on a graph-based set of optimization, there are also variable length data exchanges, which make it harder to uh, deliver an, op an, an optimal uh, performance. Next slide, please. So what if we built a system which had something dedicated built in uh, to uh, specifically accelerate embedding lookup kind of operation? And what if uh, uh, it could also scale up to a cluster where it can uh, retain a high bisection bandwidth for all to all a uh, set of communication uh, regarding embedding vectors, oftentimes a uh, set of gather scatter operations, which are required when you have sharded your embedding table across these multiple chips. And what if your programming stack also allows you to then further push that performance that you can derive from system by a host of software optimizations like the one that I talked about that is overlapping the embedding lookup operation with the downstream computations and so on. And what if it also allows you to then express your model in a way that you express it for a single chip, and then it can uh, distribute that computation across multiple chip in a way that is meaningful in terms of scale in a way that is also transparent to you. So the answer is, next slide, please, cloud TPUs. So this is not to say that cloud TPUs are the only answer, but uh, what we are going to be talking today about is the TPU embedding API, uh, and which is a layer that facilitates you to use effectively the specific hardware uh, components which have built, uh, which have been built on TPU chip. We we uh, recently uh, talked about it on uh, uh, like in our paper on a cloud TPU v4. Uh, these have been uh, part of TPU system since generation two. Uh, what I'm uh, showing here is sparse core architecture, uh, which in terms of silicon is a very small um, footprint and up to 8% as per that paper. And uh, uh, nonetheless has been specifically designed to deliver the host of interesting capabilities uh, in terms of uh, doing the uh, lookup operations in the most uh, efficient way possible. There are these, the blue tiles that you are seeing uh, here are the computation units, the fetch and flush are for the read and write from the HPM itself. And there are some vector processing unit uh, specifically uh, built for Spark score also. 
they are in that uh, specific component. And one of the key, uh, uh, you know, sort of part of this whole uh, architecture is the DMA unit, which allows uh, for this uh, uh, virtually flat memory hierarchy creation, which which means that your embedding tables can be uh, sharded across multiple chips. And thanks to the chip-to-chip -chip, uh, dedicated link that TPU systems have, uh, which deliver a really high-speed uh, network bandwidth, uh, and these DMA units can perform these operations in parallel to uh, things which may be ongoing to the uh, regular uh, uh, dense compute units on uh, TPU, such as the matrix multiplication units. So uh, this is the uh, sort of a quick view of the hardware component itself, and there are uh, lots of gory details there in the paper that I have linked, so this is a good follow-up reading after this talk. Next slide, please. So now, uh, what do we accomplish by this? So uh, we are uh, sharing here uh, a uh, performance benchmark uh, for a model uh, which involves a lot of lookup operation. I think this is DLRM0. Uh, for the baseline, we uh, uh, used uh, uh, an CPU-only implementation with 576 uh, Skylake sockets. Um, and then we compared it with what would happen if we used the TPU embedding API using TPU v3. So you can see that we can accelerate from this baseline using only 128 uh, TPU v3 chip up to 10 times. And then with TPU v4, uh, we were able to push this acceleration up to 30x uh, in, uh, in comparison to the baseline. What we are also showing is what happens when you place these embedding tables on CPUs. So there is a still some acceleration to be had thanks to the dense uh, compute acceleration because your model always has uh, those components as well. But uh, these uh, these numbers are not as good as the scenario when embedding tables can be placed on TPUs. And remember, because of that flat uh, memory hierarchy illusion, uh, this is uh, uh, something that distributes really easily, effectively, and you uh, don't have to think about how you're going to shard uh, your tables. Next slide, please. So uh, in summary, what Sparse Core delivers is a dedicated component for embedding acceleration, makes your life easy if your model has a multiple categorical feature with waiting uh, set of tables, and uh, in most cases, really large tables that you need to distribute across multiple chips, and you would uh, a TPU v4 system specifically because of this 3D toroidal mesh, which was also introduced in TPU v4, has even higher bisection bandwidth um, uh, that it can deliver. And finally, TPU embedding API uh, provides an easy programming interface uh, for the sparse code, uh, uh, for you to use the sparse code acceleration. Next slide, please. So uh, in the next few slides, we will just you know look at a uh, some concrete uh, API uh, samples. So here uh, I'm creating uh, uh, two a set of tables uh, with certain attributes, uh, and then I'm using these tables to define configuration of my features. So which are the categorical features which will use this table? As you can see that, that there may be multiple features that may be using the same table. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, once we have defined these features, we can create our set of embedding inputs and define the uh, uh, the layer uh, consisting of uh, 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 using the uh, DPU embedding API, uh, using the feature config and the required set of inputs and uh, you know whatever optimizer that you have to use and so on. Notice that we have we are not talking here in terms of how these tables are sharded across DPU chips, which is done transparently for you behind the scene. And there are also uh, a host of other optimization techniques uh, which you can supply when you call the DPU embedding API. For example, one of the things that I've been, uh, I've been, I've been alluding to uh, is the uh, overlapping of the lookup operation with computation, which is not for free because this means that there is uh, uh, equivalently, uh, some noise introduced in the process because you're not really doing the same computation uh, and because you're uh, one step ahead in terms of uh, the lookup operation. However, we have seen that for practical purposes, the trade-off does make sense and 
it is really advantageous. There are other techniques uh, such as software deduplication and handling of the hot IDs and so on, which is also done very easily with this simple API. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we have also uh, recently introduced the TPU embedding API capability to JAX. So again, I'm bringing you the same um, uh, same features that you you may be already familiar with when if you are using the TPU embedding API. Now you can use it in conjunction with JAX uh, with all its uh, uh, easy to use functional programming based paradigm where you have a lot of uh, strong uh, features in terms of uh, large scale. Uh, distributed training and slicing and dicing your model in terms of uh, you know XLS PMD capabilities. So what uh, what you're seeing here on the left hand side is that the the regular computation that uh, is there in terms of the dense compute and any other uh, ops in your model will go through uh, the XLAH LOIR path, which is the path that is typically followed uh, for this uh, uh, the the usual JAX code that you. Uh, uh, maybe already using, but on the right-hand side, there is a specific TF-OFF kernel that is uh, used behind the scene by the JAX uh, DPU embedding API to then also leverage these acceleration capabilities that we've been talking about. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to hand it off to Imerick, uh, who is going to talk about DPU embedding API in real life. Imerick, take it away. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Emric Damien. I'm working at Snap as an ML engineer, uh, part of the uh, ad ranking team. And I mainly focus on uh, recommendation systems. And yeah, very glad to be here today to share some of our experience working with TPU and TPU and embedding API. So yeah, first, uh, let me give you just a brief overview of Snap ad ranking environment. So you can get a better idea of the type of model we're dealing with. So at ranking, uh, at ad ranking, we actually say we aim to serve uh, like the right ad to the right user at the right time, and to do so, we build models to estimate the probability that a user engage with an ad. And to make more accurate prediction, we actually use many features. Um, yeah, and I listed here we use multiple thousand of continuous features. Uh, those can be things like counter, how many times the ad was clicked on, for example, rate features, uh, click rate for a certain ad, etc. And alongside with uh, those continuous features, we also have uh, multiple hundreds of categorical features. For example, uh, an ad ID or a list of ad ID user interacted with in the past, for example. And such features actually have a huge cardinality and they're also very sparse in nature. Uh, next, our architecture, model architecture usually is pretty standard for uh, recommendation uh, models. For example, uh, those uh, deep and cross network, uh, PLE or a mixture of expert for multitask learning. And on the distributed training side, we're mostly using Vertex AI because it gives a very convenient way for us to uh, run distributed training and schedule all these instances. And uh, yeah, on the ML hardware side, our training now is mostly based on TPUv3 or CT2 cores. And for some of our recent, most largest uh, model experiment, we use 128 cores. And on serving side, we're using um, a combination of either CPU only or CPU and GPU uh, instances. And for the CPU plus GPU, we offset the embedding on CPU and the uh, DNN to the heavy matmul to the GPU. Uh, yeah, and I also listed a link uh, down. So if you want more information, there are many more over there. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, cool, yeah, so I also wanted to express some of the recommendation system challenges uh, regarding ML hardware. And as I mentioned, we have many categorical features. So we make use of large embedding tables. And I think, uh, tra traditionally, uh, special ML hardware has usually really favored large metric multiplication. For example, that's typical to computer vision, uh, also NLP. But recommenders uh, on the hardware side also have additional requirements. We want fast embedding lookups for all these different uh, embedding tables. Uh, to fit them, we also need large memory size. And uh, those embedding lookups are very 
memory uh, intensive uh, memory bandwidth intensive uh, operation in nature so we also need high memory bandwidth uh, next please yeah so, oh. Good thing. Yeah, so why using TPU? Actually, because it fits many of the specificities uh, I just mentioned. It has high compute performance uh, with high bandwidth and fast inter -chip, uh, chips interconnect, which is pretty important for distributed training. Uh, the memory is also pretty big, like the base TPU V3.8 already provides 128 gigs of RAM, and for 128 cores, uh, it goes up to 2 terabytes. So that's really convenient to fit large model. And then uh, the TPU embedding API is also very convenient for first optimizing all embedding based operation. Uh, and secondly, to fit those large embedding tables called multiple cores. And yeah, and, and this really helps us because virtually it's uh, by sharding those large embedding tables across the entire TPU memory, it's very convenient for us to fit uh, virtually any uh, embedding table size uh, to the TPU device. And now, last, something also pretty important, I think, especially recently with all the focus on large language model, uh, we can also apply some of those techniques, uh, transformer techniques, to some sequence features that we have in, um, in recommendation models. And TPU supports model parallelization that uh, also help to uh, distribute such high uh, and expensive operation across multiple TPU cores. Um, yeah, but but next are some of the challenges we also face in the TPU integration. Um, yeah, so sometimes it can be a bit uh, more difficult to integrate TPU compared to CPU or GPU. Uh, a few TensorFlow ops might not be available, and uh, yeah, there is also no asynchronous training. Uh, mode out of the box, which, uh, which, yeah, because sometimes when we try to scale to a very high number of device, uh, we see that the uh, uh, scaling is not linear, so asynchronous training mode, uh, yeah, could be helpful. And uh, last, also have a, a link below where we have many more details if you're interested in. Uh, next, please. Cool. So, uh, yeah, here are some actually. Uh, benchmark result uh, running TPU on some of our own uh, ad ranking models and how they compare to our previous CPU based uh, training system. Um, yeah, uh, for some context, uh, I did there both a standard model and a heavy model. So, standard is kind of more typical at SNAP, and you can see it as a model where the embedding lookup is actually taking a decent uh, proportion of the total compute. And the uh, heavy model, on the other hand, the DNN and cross network are actually much larger. So uh, in this model, the mat mule actually much more heavy. And uh, yeah, you can observe uh, from the benchmark results that actually in all scenario, TPV2 and V3 uh, were all able to beat uh, our older CPU training baseline. And uh, yeah, you can note that the introduction of the TPU embedding API actually greatly improved um, model training throughput. For example, for the TPU V2, uh, it's almost doubled from 1.3x throughput to 2.4. So that was uh, really great gains. And for the TPU V3, we almost get 70% higher throughput. So uh, very good gain there too. And uh, also, I think it's interesting to note that for the heavy model, when the, we combine those uh, improvement coming from the TPU embedding API for fast lookups, plus the additional uh, computation uh, like the TFLOP provided uh, by the TPU over those larger MATMUL, all together we actually get really, really good speed up uh, with 4, 4x for the TPU v2.32 and almost 10x for the v3.32. V3 uh, yeah, so so we actually were very pleased uh, with those improvement of migrating our training to uh, TPU, and this really uh, helped us to uh, run experiment at a much faster pace and also iterate on model quality even faster. Uh, uh, next, please. Cool. So. 
Uh, yeah, next I also wanted to share some benchmark. We did with GPUs. Uh, here we compare a TPU V332 with actually eight uh, NVIDIA 800. Uh, yeah, and we can see that TPU were uh, able uh, again to get uh, 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 the best results. And uh, TPU embedding API here was really important because it really gave that uh, extra performance uh, co compared to our, to our implementation of uh, GPU training. Uh, next, please. And yeah, so overall, we found that our TPU setup was about uh, 1.4x faster than GPU. And uh, even though in Google Cloud, uh, 800 might cost less than a TPU v3.8, uh, the additional throughput actually made the, uh, the total training cost even lower. So here, we save 22% uh, compared to the GPU job. And uh, yeah, I also wanted to provide just some more details on uh, the benchmark. So we try to run the benchmark in a actually uh, well-optimized environment, uh, also for, for the GPU, by using uh, NVIDIA-optimized uh, NGC Docker image with a CUDNN uh, horrible for distributed training, uh, which show uh, about 10% uh, additional throughput compared to TF distribution strategy. Uh, yeah, but you can note here that uh, we, we use tensor, TensorFlow, the default TensorFlow 32, not mixed precision, and uh, we also did not leverage a uh, huge CTRTF plugin that also have some uh, some embedding optimization. So yeah, so as a next step, we'll work on optimizing the GPU, but another major focus for us will uh, be to actually benchmark and migrate to TPU v4 because TPU v4 should also have even better TPU embedding acceleration, which should uh, actually greatly improve our model training performance. So yeah, re really looking forward to that. Cool, uh, next. Uh, all right, yeah, handing back to Vaiha for the conclusion. Thanks. Thank you, Amarik, uh, for uh, sharing the details of this uh, case study. This is uh, this is very helpful. And needless to say, like uh, also Amarik mentioned that all the benchmarks are uh, to some degree imperfect and uh yeah looking forward to also the results after you have had chance to do the optimization on gpu side i'm sure that those will also be great results in summary the key takeaway for the talk today is that cloud dp has a dedicated sparse core component for accelerating embedding lookup operation this is uh made available or accessible or useful to you using tp embedding api which helps you leverage uh, the default capabilities as well as a set of uh, software optimizations such as compute and lookup overlap, the software deduplication, and so on. And this API is now also available via JAX. And this is uh, a part of the TFRS package. So please uh, uh, go to our uh, TFRS website and uh, you can give it a spin. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, that was a quite uh, interesting talk uh, for accelerating uh, embeddings. Um, so I have uh, one question for Amrik and one question for uh, Abhav. Uh, so Amrik, in your experience, how I guess how hard or how challenging uh, was it to migrate GPU code to TPU embedding? Yeah. So. It's, I would say it's, uh, it, it's not too challenging, uh, but you kind of need to learn a bit how the TPU embedding API works. And, uh, and yeah, I, I would say this is how, uh, how, how do you say, how, um, uh, it's like the optimization just meant that all the TPU, uh, all the embedding must be defined uh, before calling the model function. So in our case, for example, we used to, uh, our embedding had dynamic dimension shape and uh, based on the cardinality of this embedding, and we used to compute that as part of the model function. So the only challenge was kind of move that out of the model function. Uh, but I think overall it's not too, too complicated. And uh, yeah, and thanks to this, uh, the performance of the TPU embedding API, it was actually well, well worth spent for us to to do this migration. Great. I think uh, more people may want to migrate to TPU embeddings then. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. So one one last question for Webhav. Um, without discussing any like specific roadmap details, uh, do you think uh, um, like future generations of TP Sparse uh, Core? Um, are we at the stage where the, our current generation of TPU embeddings are already fast enough for recommendation models or the capacity already sufficient for like most companies? Yeah, I think based on what we have heard from our users, uh, we have uh, very strong feedback on V3 and V4 generation. And uh, definitely, uh, I'm hoping that in future we'll have uh, further enhancements like we have uh, uh, been trying to push the performance on TPU on all fronts. Uh, we, we definitely also think about ranking and recommendation use case uh, very deeply. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, I think uh, let's uh, uh, wrap up this uh, part of the uh, talk. And uh, uh, Amrik also mentioned dynamic shape in embedding table. Our next talk will talk about, cover exactly that. Uh, they Divya will talk about dynamic embedding. And uh, thanks again, guys. And uh, well, I'll hand it over to uh, uh, Divya. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Divya. I'm a software engineer on the CARES team. Uh, today, I'll be presenting on Keras Dynamic Embedding Layer. Uh, it's an efficient approach for handling changing input patterns to a model with embedding layer. Uh, next slide, please. So currently, the static embedding layer that learns and maps the discrete inputs, such as words or tokens, to dense vector representations, commonly referred to as embeddings. The Keras Embedding Layer is frequently used in recommendations, search and ranking where the goal is to provide personalized recommendations to users based on their preferences and behaviors so the embedding layer is used to represent discrete features such as user id item id or contextual information in a continuous and dense vector space so however the current static embedding layer encounters the problem of embedding drift so what is embedding drift um, in an online recommendation system, users' preferences and item characteristics may evolve over time. Uh, it is known as embedding drift, where the original embeddings become less representative of the current data, preferences, or uh, characteristics. So when significant changes occur, it might be necessary to periodically retrain the model with updated data to capture the latest dynamics act accurately. So the embedding drift often requires users to recompute the vocabulary keys and remap the embedding matrix and restart the training, which is an unnecessary added cognitive and manual workload overhead. Um, next slide, please. So towards these efforts, the Keras team is introducing the dynamic embedding layer. Uh, in this design approach, the dynamic embedding layer is composed of two layers, the dynamic lookup layer and the embedding layer. So the dynamic lookup layer is responsible for maintaining an internal vocabulary table using an eviction policy that is updated based on input pattern and performing the vocabulary lookup for the given input and returning the inde integer index. And this index is then passed to the embedding layer which looks up the embedding vector for the given integer index and then returns the embedding vector. So the embedding vector is then used by the subsequent layers in the neural network. And the dynamic embedding layer is used in conjunction with the update embedding callback. So this callback is triggered at a predetermined time interval. It aggregates the internal vocabulary table uh, across all workers if you're using a distributed setup. And this ensures that the vocabulary is always up to date and all the workers are using the same vocabulary for the lookup. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take a deeper look at what is done in the dynamic lookup layer and how the update embedding callback updates the embeddings and the vocabulary. So the dynamic lookup layer identifies and adds unique keys passed as, as inputs to the layer and updates the internal vocabulary table. So this table is constantly updated based on eviction policies such as uh, time to live, LFU, LRU, etc. So when used with distributed training, the table is maintained on each worker and the tables on different workers may be different. 
And the callback aggregates the internal vocabulary table across all the workers in a distributed training setup and updates the main vocabulary lookup table on all the workers. So the update emitting callback is a timed callback that uses a timed thread to create callback event when the timer expires. So to summarize, the update emitting uh, callback updates the vocab to index mapping on all workers and updates the updates and remaps the embedding matrix to reflect the new vocabulary index mapping where old vocabulary keys will have the same embedding vectors and the new added uh, vocab keys will have newly initialized embedding vectors. So this updated vocabulary is used for lookup in the dynamic lookup layer until the callback event is triggered again after the time interval expires again. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a code example to demonstrate how to use the dynamic embedding layer. So you would define your training data, labels, initial vocabulary. You can leave the initial vocabulary as none, and uh, the layer will build the vocabulary automatically based on the input pattern. And you can specify the eviction policy, like uh, least frequently used, time to live, LRU, whatever, and the model, and define the model to use the dynamic embedding layer. And uh, next slide, please. And then you would define the update embedding callback where you can specify the time interval at which you would like to aggregate the vocabulary tables across all workers and update the main lookup vocabulary table. Uh, the update embedding callback is a time callback. So uh, once this is done, you can run model fit and you can sit back and watch your model train, update vocabulary based on new input patterns, and then remap and update the embedding matrix uh, and continue to train uh, to provide you with the most updated relevant model with little to no manual intervention. This is still work in progress. We have a working flow, but we're working on improving the performance. Like This is a starting point, and we recognize there's a lot of room for improvement to performance for this layer, and we'll try and continue to serve the best product possible. Thank you. Our next slide, please. So yeah, uh, here is a link for a uh, request for comment uh, that was submitted in the TensorFlow community uh, repo. So you could go through the design in more detail here. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Divya. Um, uh, we are we're uh, over time so well uh, for those questions we haven't addressed that during q and q and a time well we'll do that offline uh, so make sure to follow up on the uh on our uh, live stream platform um i'll pass it back to um ashley to wrap up thank you Thank you everyone for these fantastic talks and thank you everyone who joined us and watched uh, for the event. It was uh, an honor to host you and a huge thank you again and congratulations to our speakers uh, for all of the amazing content that they've shared today. Um, that's a wrap for us. Um, if, you, if you would like to reach out, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can reach us on our TensorFlow forum uh, at to discuss.tensorflow.org. Um, I'm re reposting the links that Wei added at the beginning, the recommendation systems landing page, the TensorFlow recommenders, and the Palm API. And um, with that, we thank you so much, and we hope we have you have a good rest of your day, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. Take care. Bye-bye.